Hey guys, welcome back to another one of these kind of walkthrough papers. This time it's again for the foundation tier and we're going to do the paper two aiming for a grade five. So again, the link is going to be in the description if you would like to have a go before you watch this video or if you want to have a go after watching this video. But again, keep in mind that if you're looking at this video or you're looking at this paper and you're thinking, damn, this is really, really tough, I'm kind of worried. Don't worry, your real paper will not be as difficult as this. This is just the peak of foundation. This is basically as hard as every single topic could possibly be, but your paper will not be this difficult. Without further ado, let's just get straight into question number one, starting off with a scatter graph, showing the information about the amount of rainfall in millimeters and the number of hours of sunshine for each of 10 English towns on the same day. So we have all this information, cool, cool, cool. This all looks good. One of these points is an outlier. Write down the coordinates of this point. So first thing we need to talk about what an outlier is. An outlier is just a piece of data that is very far away from all of the other pieces of data. Now they've told us that one exists. Okay, so if I look at this, I can see a general trend going downwards, right? That's good. But if I, if I were to draw a line going down here, a line of best fit, this would kind of be out there, right? That would be definitely the outlier in this case. And the coordinates there, look at the x coordinate, that is 2, and the y coordinate is 1. It's between 0 and 2. Part B, ignoring the outlier, describe the relationship between the amount of rainfall and the number of hours of sunshine. So if we have a look, as the amount of rainfall increases, the number of hours of sunshine decreases. Okay, or vice versa, which, I mean, it should make sense, right? We live in the UK, we're well experienced with both of these, if you live in the UK anyway. So... As you can see, as the amount of rainfall increases, our number of hours is dropping down, okay? Another way you can see this, which might help, it's actually probably gonna help for the next part, is if we just draw a cheeky little line of best fit. So if I draw a line of best fit, it's probably gonna be something similar to this. Again, keep in mind, your results may vary. Um, but maybe something looking a little like that would be our line of best fit. So as you can see, that is a pretty steep decrease, okay? So all we'd have to do is write something along the lines of as the amount of, as the amount of rainfall increases, the number of hours of sunshine decreases. Okay, anything along those lines. So you could also say, as the amount of rainfall decreases, the number of hours of sunshine increases, right? Anything that's equivalent to that. So you do get a lot of variation. If you're unsure if your answer would be accepted, leave it in the comments or email me and I'll respond telling you whether it would be accepted and why. But in general, you wanna just say, as X increases, so whatever's on the X axis increases, the Y axis does what? Increase, decrease what? On the same day in another English town, there were seven hours of sunshine, so we have to estimate the amount of rainfall in this town on this day using the scatter graph. Well, what you do here is draw your line of best fit, which I've already done, and then we're gonna have seven hours of sunshine. So find seven, right? So we have four, six, seven should be right in between these two values. Draw a dotted line until it hits your line of best fit, and you're gonna draw a dotted line going straight down until you touch your x-axis, okay? And again, with this question, there's going to be quite a lot of variation depending on your line of best fit because your line of best fit could be slightly steeper or it could be slightly shallower than mine. So you do get a fairly decent range, okay? And the range is anywhere between three, which would be here, and four. So you get quite a fat range. In this case, what is it? So it goes up in point ones, I think. So point one, two, three, four, five. No, it doesn't go up in point twos. So 0.24683, so 3.4 I'm gonna say, okay? And again, anywhere between three and four is perfectly acceptable. Festival A will be in a regular field with a rectangular field even, I can't read, with an area of 80,000 square meters. The greatest number of people allowed is 425. Festival B is in a rectangular field, 700 meters by 2000 meters, and the greatest number of people allowed is 6,750. The area per person allowed for Festival B is greater than the area per person allowed for Festival A. But how much greater? Give your answer to the nearest whole number. This is a pretty damn good question. It's tricky 
because again it's asking you to calculate something we've never calculated before area per person okay so we have to use our logic a bit so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the answer section in half for A and B because we need to wipe this out for A and B okay so first of all A what do we have we have the area the area is 80,000 square meters and it tells me that the number of people is 425 so all I've done is I've literally looked at the information and extracted the actual mathematical information right in this case it's the area and the number of people now if I think about it it's the area per person the way you can think about it is it's going to be how much space each person gets so if I was dividing now forget the meter squared for a second if I was dividing 80,000 between 425 people how would I work that out right so let's say I had 80,000 pounds and I wanted to give it out between 425 people it's all the same thing working out how much each person would get if we were to divide this out so per person we're going to have 80,000 divided by 425 and remember this is a calculator paper so we can use shockingly a calculator 80 1 2 3 divided by 4 2 5 and that gives us an answer of 188.23 blah 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 now it does say we need to do it to the nearest whole number but I'm just going to write this to two decimal places just to make sure our answer is relatively accurate okay so in this case each person would get 188.24 square meters okay so that's how much space each human being would get so first of all B we have to do a few extra steps because we don't have the area but it says it's a rectangular field so let's draw a rectangle and it's 700 meters by 2000 right so obviously the longer side is the bigger number so how can I work out the area of a rectangle well all you would do is multiply those two numbers together 700 times 2000 and again you can use your calculator but you know 7 times 2 is 14 and then we're just going to add on 5 zeros 1 2 3 4 5 so that is 1 million 400 thousand square meters okay now we're going to do the exact same thing the number of people so again we've used this information for the area now we're going to use this other information the number of people which is said to be 6,750 so per person we're going to have 1,400,000 meters squared over 6,750 so if we do this division now we will be able to get our answer so 141,2,3,4,5 so if you notice I'm actually counting how many zeros there are because it's very easy to make a mistake when you have numbers this big okay and especially when most of them are zeros just please make sure that you put enough zeros on your calculator I have genuinely seen people higher foundation a level doesn't matter that don't put the right kind of uh, zeros on it that's 207.41 again I'm going to round it to two decimal places okay just because I can't bother to write the whole thing now if you look at the actual question it says the area per person for B is greater than a well that's good because the number here is bigger than the number here good that's a good sign right how much greater nearest whole number so all we're doing is 207.41 minus 188.24 and just rounding that to whatever the nearest number is so 207 whoops that's times point for one minus 188.24 that gives me 19.17 so this is the nearest whole number is 19 square meters more that that person gets for four marks I don't it's not that bad right so in terms of the marks here's where you get the marks you obviously get marks for working out the area you get marks for working out this and also this at the same time you get a mark for working out doing that calculation and obviously a mark for getting the actual correct final answer okay but bear in mind this first step here is actually one mark shared between them okay so this mark here and here for part B and this is a fun question Callum says 300 centimeters squared is the same as 3 meters squared because it's 100 centimeters in a meter so you divide by 100 he's wrong explain why so here's where things are going to get interesting okay this is a mistake I've seen so many people make and I was a victim of it too many many times 
here's how I would explain it. He's right, there's 100 centimetres in a metre, so you would divide by 100 to go from centimetres to metres, right? So that makes sense, right? So to go from centimetres to metres, you divide by 100. We all know this, right? But if you notice, we're not going from centimetres to metres. We're going from centimetres squared to metres squared. So we have to divide by 100 squared. It's the same thing if you're doing volume, centimetres cubed to metres cubed. You divide by 100 cubed, okay? It's for each dimension. So all you'd have to do for saying like why he's wrong, all you'd have to do is, you could just work it out if you want to. So you could just do 300 centimetres squared divided by 100 squared would actually give you uh, 0 0.03 square metres. Right, if you wanted to, something similar to that. But that would probably be the best way to do it and writing out these actual conversions, okay? But just be really careful with those conversions. They can really uh, catch you off guard. So this question actually has a few little kind of twists and turns on the normal percentage profit kind of question. So Nimrod buys three kilograms box of sweets for £17.60, puts them all into bags. Each bag contains 150 grams. She fills as many as possible sells each for the same price and she wants to make a profit of at least 35%. So what is the lowest price you should charge? This is a really interesting question because normally we actually kind of work backwards and we work, well, not backwards, we work out what her profit would be. In this case, we have a target profit and work out how much each one should cost, okay? So it's really interesting. So the first thing I want to do is actually work out how many bags of sweets she actually sells, right? So three kilogram box and she's breaking into 150 gram bags. So three kilograms is 3000 grams. And if we divide that by 15, that will give us the number of bags she actually creates, right? So it'd be 20 bags of sweets. Again, just use a calculator. Right? That makes sense so far, right? So three kilograms, that's, the, that's normal. This is normal so far, right? So we get that mark completely for free. So that is a free mark right there. Now, she wants to make a profit of at least 35%. Okay. Now, again, the mark scheme method, in my opinion, is not the one that makes the most sense. Okay. So feel free, if you don't get my method, again, leave it in the comments. I'll address you, no worries. But you can also check the marketing for a slightly different method, but I prefer this one. She wants to make a profit of 35%. So what I'm going to do is, and, and what is profit? Well, profit is the money you get above what you bought in the first place, right? So she's already paid £17.60. So she wants an additional 35% on top of this. So the way we can work that out, and this is my personal favorite way, is it's a percentage increase. So 35% profit in total is 100 plus 35, 135% of the original amount. So if I times that by 135%, that is the total amount of money she should make from selling the sweets, okay? So 17.6 multiplied by 135%, okay? And you get 23 pounds and 76 P. That's how much money she should sell all of the bags of sweets for in total. So each bag, should cost £23.76 over 20. Let's have a look at that. And that is 1.118. So obviously, you know, you can't have 0.8 of a penny. So we're just going to call it £1.19. Okay. Now, this is actually a five mark question. Okay. And the mark scheme actually has way more steps than this, okay? But if you look, I've done one, two, three steps for five marks. And in my opinion, this makes more sense. If it doesn't, again, message, email me, leave a message in the comments, whatever, I can help you out, okay? But there is another method in the mark scheme. I think they overcomplicate it personally. There's decimals, they're adding them, they're doing all this crazy stuff. I think this makes a bit more sense, okay? But I'll leave that to your judgment. Okay, so we've probably seen this type of question about 400,000 times by now. 
So it's a pairing two offers, okay? But again, it has a little bit of a twist. So a shop has two different special offers on milk. Milk, two pints, four pints, you get 75p, one pound 28. But then there's pay for two bottles, get a bottle free, but also pay for one bottle, get one bottle half price. So which one gives the best value for money? Loads of different ways to do this, right? You can work out how much it costs to buy 10 pints or something for each one and uh, do it that way. Or you can kind of do a different way. So what I'm going to do, and again, I hope this makes sense to you, is I'm going to assume that we use the entire offer, okay? So we're gonna do this entire offer. We're gonna pay for two bottles and get one free, work out how much milk that is, okay? So pay for two bottles, that is going to be one pound 50, right? So the cost there is one pound 50. And how much, how many pints do we get? Well, we get two pint, uh, two bottles. Each bottle has two pints, so that's four pints, and a bottle free. So then we get six pints. So two pints paid for, seventy-five p. Four pints, one pound fifty. Six pints, still one pound fifty. So let's leave it as that for now. Now, what about for this next one? Well, we get pay for one bottle, get one another bottle half price. So that's two bottles, and each one has four pints. So that's going to be eight pints. Now let's work out the actual cost. Well, if we whip out our calculators, we have one pound 28, because that's what one bottle is, plus another one for half price. So the way you could work this out is literally just do brackets, half, so 0 0.5 times 1.28, okay? Or you can just know that half of that is going to be, um, 64p. So you could also just do 64p and you get the exact same answer, £1.92. Now you might look at this and think, well hang on a minute, there's two different pintages there. All you want to do is make them the same. So you can either work out one pint or two pints or ten pints for each of these. I always recommend just going down to one pint or one kilogram or one whatever. So we're just going to do one pint for each of these. So for the one on the right, what we're going to do is we're going to divide both sides by eight. Eight pints is one pound ninety-two, so that means one pint is one pound ninety-two divided by eight, which gives us twenty-four pence. Okay, so zero pounds twenty-four. We're going to do the same thing on this side, except it's going to be one pound fifty divided by six. So one point five divided by six gives us an answer of twenty-five p. So which one is cheaper? Well. Seems like offer two. Offer two is cheaper. Okay. Four marks, not too bad. Um, hopefully that will make sense. Again, that is the exact way I'll do it. But again, I know some of you like to work out maybe two pints or 10 pints or something else. That is also completely fine. But please keep in mind, you can't just say, well, one bottle is this and the other bottle is that. You have to use the whole offer, which is why this question is a little bit trickier, okay? Because let's face it, if you're walking to a supermarket and there's buy one, get one half price, you're going to get two, right? Surely. So with question five, we first have simplify x cubed to the power of five. So what you need to remember here is that when you have a bracket with another power, you multiply the powers together. So that's x to the power of three times five. So that's x to the power of 15. For expand and simplify, all you need to do is expand the brackets and then collect the like terms. So expanding brackets, we have four on the outside, so it needs to times both of the things on the inside. So four times x gives me four x. Four times plus three gives me 12. Then we have seven times four, which is 28. And then seven times minus two x, which is minus 14 x. Okay, so that's the expand bit, that gives me one mark. The simplify bit is where you actually add everything together. So if I look at the x's that I have first, we have 4x here and then minus 14x. So that would be 4 minus 14, which is minus 10x. And then we have plus 12 plus another 28, which would give me plus 40 for the final mark. Factorize fully, this is where uh, things can get a bit complicated when there's multiple different letters. But all we need to do is look at what's common between these two numbers. So I'm going to start with the actual numbers, right? So 
15 and 3, what's the biggest thing I can divide both numbers by? What's the biggest times table they both appear in? That is the 3 times table. Okay, so I've done the numbers. Now I look at the letters. What letter is common? Well, X is common between them. But how many X's are common? Well, all you need to do is write down the lowest power of X, which in this case is X squared, right? So again, just as a recap, you look at the common letters and then you write down the lowest common letter. So in this case, we have X cubed X squared, X squared smaller, so we do X squared. And Y is not common, so I don't write it. Now I'll put my brackets. 3 times what gives me 15? That would be 5. I have X squared, but I need X cubed, which means I need another X. And now that will give me 15 X cubed, as the question states. Then we can put a plus. 3, time, three is already 3, so we're done. X squared is already X squared, so we're done. However, there is a Y here, so we need to make this a Y. That will give you the two marks. Now, if you want to check your answer, you can check your answer just by expanding it again. So 3 times 5 would give me 15. X squared times X gives me X cubed. 3X squared times Y would give me 3X squared Y. So that means I know for sure that I'm correct because I've expanded the bracket again to check. Here are the first five terms of an arithmetic sequence. Find an expression in terms of n for the nth term of this sequence. So here's a really quick way to work out the nth term. What you do is you look at the difference between the numbers first, okay? And as you can see, it's always adding 6, right? Every single time, add 6. You write that exact number, so in this case just 6, you don't need to put the plus, obviously. But if it was minus, you would have to put the minus. And you write the letter n. Then what you do is you work out the term before the first one. So if I'm adding 6 to go to the right, I should be subtracting 6 to go to the left, right? And what is 7 minus 6? It's 1. And all you do is you put plus and that number. But again, if that number is negative, you'd make this negative as well. So just as a recap, you put the difference in front of n, whether it's positive or negative, and then you work out the term before the first term, write that down whether it's positive or negative. It will always give you the right answer. So, it then says the nth term of a different sequence is 8 minus 6n. Is minus 58 a term in the sequence? Show how you get your answer. So the key point here is that all you need to do is write out the nth term and equal it to minus 58 and show that it is the exact same thing. Okay, so show that you can get n equals a whole number. So the first thing I do is I minus 8 from both sides. That gives me minus 6n equals minus 66 and then all I do is I divide both sides by 6 I get minus n is equal to minus 11 which means n is equal to 11 so the answer is yes this only works if n is a whole number okay if you get a decimal or you get a fraction or you get a negative then it's not a term of this sequence okay n has to be a positive integer when it comes to sequences. A new phone costs £679 and it decreases at a rate of 4% per year. Work out the value of the phone at the end of three years. This is the exact same as the compound interest formula, however we're decreasing instead of increasing. So 100% is the original value of the, of the phone or whatever item it is. And if it's decreasing by 4%, we're going to subtract 4%, which gives us 96%. And then if you remember the compound interest formula, you take the original amount of money, so in this case the new phone costing £679, you times it by the percentage change, which is going to be a number either less than or greater than 100, and you put it to the power of the number of years. And that's all you need to do and you can get those marks, okay? I've done quite a few types of questions like this, so hopefully you guys are okay, but if not, again, leave a message in the comments or email me and I will go through it with you. Do all this and you get 600 pound, so well you get 600.7357, but let's use our brains. Money is always to two decimal places, right? Because think about it, you can't have six pounds and five, nine, three pence, right? So it'd be 600.74 pounds. And that's it. So although it's three marks, you can do it all in one step, which I quite like. This sign was in a doctor's waiting room. 115 appointments were missed last month. 
And these missed appointments were a total of 25.3 hours. And it says to work out the mean length of time for each missed appointment. And you have to give your answer in minutes. So working out the mean, all you need to do is you do the total divided by the number, right? So if this was in hours, all you'd have to do is do 25.3 divide 115. And that would give us the mean number of hours each appointment was. However, it says to give your answer in minutes. So the first thing I'm going to do is change 25.3 hours into minutes. Now, how many minutes are in an hour? 60. So all we're going to do is times by 60 to get the number of minutes. And again, we're going to use our good old calculator to help us out with this. 25.3 multiplied by 60 gives me 1518 minutes. 8 minutes. And then just using our mean formula, we're going to take that total number of minutes, 1518, and divide it by the 115 appointments that were missed. Divide by 115 gives you an answer of 13.2 minutes. So what that means is each appointment was around 13.2 minutes that was missed. For this question, we have a table showing information about the number of social media accounts used by each of 300 students. And it gives us tables, so number 0 to 4, gives us the frequency, nice. Work at the total number of social media accounts used by these students. So this is actually halfway to working out the mean number of social media accounts. Okay, because remember when you work out the mean, you need the total divided by, in this case, the number of students, which is 300. So how do we do that? All we do is we times each of these numbers, Work out that and then add them all up down here, okay? So the reason why is because three people use zero social media accounts. So that means the total number of social media accounts for these three people is zero, right? The next 57 people use one account. So 57 times one in total, that's 57 social media accounts. The next 84 people use two accounts each. So that is, and again, we're going to use a calculator because I feel a bit lazy, 84 times 2, 168 accounts in total, right? Because each of them have 2. So 168. And then 75 times 3, which is 225. Right, so the next 75 people have 3 accounts. 81 times 4, which is, um, again, we can just use a calculator. We don't need to actually work it out, but either way, We've got 324, okay? So then the total number of social media accounts used is just all of these numbers added together, which gives us an answer of, so 324, let's do it backwards, 225 plus 168 plus 57 plus zero. Gives an answer of 774 social media accounts, okay? It then says, find the median number of social media accounts used by the students. So what I'm going to do is I have 300 students in total, right? And if you notice, this data is in order. Because remember, with the median, you put the data in order and then you find the middle, right? Halfway along. With this, the data is already in order, right? We have three zeros, 57 ones, 84 twos, 75 threes, and so on, right? So all we need to do is find the middle. Well, if we have 300 students... That means the middle will be the 150th value. Okay, so how do we find that out? Well, that's a really good question. All we do is we continue to add up the frequencies until we get to more than 150. So there are three here. Now 60, right? Because we've got three in this first one, we've got another 57, so we've added that on, that's 60. Add another 84, which will bring us to 120. So 144, right? So still not 150 yet. And then the next one is going to be 144 plus another 75. So what we're doing here is we're working out the total number of values that are before this number, right? So we have three zeros. Then we have 57 ones. So in total, we've got 60 values. Then 144 values, now 219. If you notice, we're actually above the number. So the answer is going to be three because it can't be in the number two because only 144 people are up to and including two. 
But then if we go to the next one, up to and including three is 219. So somewhere in this group of people with three uh, social media accounts, there is our median value. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense. But again, let me know in the comments and I can help you out. Here we have some proportionality. So water flows through each of the pipes that fill a lake at the same rate. And it takes four pipes, 12 hours to fill the lakes, the lake even. Look at how many hours it takes six pipes to fill a quarter of the lake. There are two ways to do this, okay? <clears throat> so I'm gonna call one method A. I'm gonna call another method B. Method A involves working out how much work is required to fill the lake. So all you do is you multiply the two numbers they give you, okay? So again, this can be, you know, it, it takes four builders, 10 hours to build a house, I don't know. How long will it take six builders to build the same house? You do the same thing, you times the number of things by the amount of time. So four times 12 gives me an answer of 48. So essentially 48 pieces of work need doing to fill this lake, okay? Now it says that we're only filling a quarter of the lake. So this is how much is required to fill the full lake. I only want a quarter, so I'm gonna do 48 divided by four, which is 12. It then says we have six pipes. So remember, originally, right, we had four times 12 because there's four pipes doing 12 hours. So if I wanna work out the time, all I need to do is take this amount of work and divide it between each of the pipes, which gives me two hours, okay? Now method B is using a bit of logic, okay? Now, if I have four pipes originally, so I wanna say four pipes, 12 hours, right? And then like one whole lake, so full lake. Now I'm having six pipes, right? So that jump, I've times it by 1.5, right? Or in other words, I've times it by six over four, okay? Now, logically speaking, if I have more pipes, it should take less time, right? Think about it. If I, if I was trying to get you to fill something up and I gave you one hose pipe and I wanted you to fill up a swimming pool, and then I gave you two hose pipes, it should take you half as long, right? Because you have twice as many hose pipes. So I'm gonna divide the time by six over four. Because we've times the number of pipes by six over four, and I got that by just doing six divided by four. So I'm gonna divide it on this other side. And again, six over four is the same as 1.5 if you wanna use that. Now, instead of a full lake, we're doing a quarter of a lake. So we've divided the amount of volume by four. Well, again, let's think about it. If I was asking you to fill up a swimming pool, right, and it took you four hours, and then I said, okay, only fill it up a quarter of the way, since it's four times less big, you would take four times less time, wouldn't you? Because it's only a quarter of it. So we're also going to divide it by another four. So here's what we're doing. We're doing 12 divided by six over four, gives us eight, and then we're dividing that again by four, which gives us two hours. Those are two separate ways that you can use to do it. The work method is sometimes preferred, it's more mathematical. However, I actually kind of prefer using this method because it requires a bit more logic. But whatever way you prefer, you are able to use. Ella invests 7,000 pounds for two years in an account paying compound interest. The first year is 3%, second year 1.5%, find the value of Ella's investment at the end of two years. So again, you can do this as two separate years or you can use my little formula. So with interest, that is money that you gain on top of the original value. So if it's a 3% interest rate, that means the value is going to be 100%, the original value, plus another 3%. So that makes it 103% overall. And likewise, same thing over here, you'd have 101.5%. So to work out the investment using the compound interest formula, you put that 7,000 pound, the original amount, and you times it by each of those interest rates for the number of years you have those interest rates. So in this case, it's just one year each. So you can put to the power of one if you'd like, but you don't have to because it doesn't actually do anything. 
that will give you the full answer. Three marks as well, so not too bad. I've had two of these questions so far, it's not not, not too bad. Times, and 103%, so 103. Gives us an answer of seven thousand three hundred eighteen pounds and fifteen pence, which is exactly right. Perfect. Yeah, and that's all. Uh, so if you get to, if you can learn how to use this formula by kind of looking at the examples I've given you, it is a big help because three marks and you get to do it in like one minute, <laughs> if that. It's really useful for saving some extra time. So now we have some probability. So if Lorena gets a train at the same time each morning to go to work. She gets a train at the same time each evening to come home. The probability tree diagram shows the probabilities of each train arriving late. Complete the diagram. So they haven't really given us much information, but they have given us all the information that we need. All we need to do is make sure you remember that across branches should add up to one. So all you're doing for each of these values, nice and easy, all you have to do is do one minus whatever that probability is. So one minus 0 0.13, which is 0 0.87 would go here. And using that same logic, that would be 0 0.94, and this one over here should technically be over, over here, as in the, the underline should be over here. Because again, all you're doing is making sure that across the branches, it adds up to 1. For a day that Lorena goes to work, work out the probability that the train to work and from work, so home, will both arrive late. So what we're going to do is we're going late and then late again. So if we look at those two numbers that we have, we're going to multiply them together. So 0 0.13 multiplied by 0 0.06. Okay. So again, when you go along a tree diagram, you're going to multiply the decimals together, all the fractions, depending on what you have. 0 0.06 gives me 0 0.0078. It's in standard form, and it doesn't actually say that you don't, you can't give in standard form, but we don't normally give probability is a standard form, so just changing that to a normal number be 0 0.0078. Okay, so a pretty tricky number, but overall the question isn't that bad. Okay, so for question number 13, and yes, I did change shirts, so it's a new day. Here is a graph of y equals x squared minus 6x plus 4. So give us a big, happy face, which makes sense. And he says, write down the y-intercept of the graph. So the y-intercept, what that means is, is to intercept something is to cross it, right? So the y-intercept is where the graph crosses the y-axis. And if you have a little look, that is right here. So the coordinate, or like the actual value, is at 4, right? So you just write the number 4. It then says write down the coordinates of the turning point of the graph. And the turning point, it's exactly what it says, right? It's where the graph turns. So it's either going to be the lowest possible number, or the highest. In this case, it's the lowest possible number, and it's right here. So all we need to do is read off these coordinates, and whoops, that went, went a bit up. And keep going. So that looks like 3 and minus 5. And lastly, it says use the graph to find estimates for the roots of x squared minus 6x plus 4 is 0. So what are roots? Roots is another word for solutions, okay? So what they mean is we're trying to look for the values of x where x squared minus 6x plus 4 is equal to 0. Now, on your graph, what does this look like? Well, if you notice, this is the equation of the graph. It's the exact same thing, but they've made it equal to 0. They've made y equal 0. And where does y equal 0? Along the x-axis. So we're literally just looking at the points where the graph crosses the x-axis, and if we, you know, zoom a little bit in, uh, each kind of t every ten blocks you could say is one whole one whole number. <clears throat> so it's each block is just zero point one. So zero point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So zero point eight for the first one. And as you can see, since it crosses the x-axis uh, x twice, that means there's going to be two values. So five, five point one, and five point two. And that'll be it for that question. For this question, we have here are four cards. There is a number on each card, four, seven, six, and three. Write down the smallest 
four digit even number that can be made using each card only once. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a trick. If you want to do the biggest number, all you do is you write the numbers in order of a size. So in this case it would be 7, 6, 4, 3. So you literally write it in order of size from biggest to smallest. The smallest number <clears throat> is the exact reverse. You write them in order of size going from smallest to biggest. 3, 4, 6, 7. So that's a trick. If they ever ask you to write down the smallest or largest number, if it's the largest number or biggest number, you start with the biggest number and you work your way down. The smallest, you start with the smallest number and work your way up. But they've made this slightly harder, hence why it's a grade 5 paper, by saying smallest even number. Now, <clears throat> all I'm going to do is say, what is an even number? What does an even number have to end in? An even number has to end in 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. Those are the only numbers that even numbers end in. So the last digit needs to be a 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. Okay? So I have two cards that fit that criteria, 4 and 6. So which one should I use? Well, because I'm trying to do the smallest number, the last digit should be the biggest possible number. But I have another condition. It has to also be an even number. So I just take the biggest even number. And I'll literally write it at the back. Okay? And then all I'll do is I'll tick this off and then follow the same rule. So I'm going to write the numbers from biggest to small, well in this case smallest to biggest. So 3, 4 and 7. 3. Okay, and that's exactly how I approach those kinds of questions. I hope you found that a bit useful. This question, it says the length of a football pitch is 90 metres to the nearest metre. So complete the error interval for the length of the football pitch. So all we need to do is think of the numbers that will round to 90. So all I would do here is what's the smallest number that would round up to 90? Well, we know it's going to be 89 and something, right? Now, what digit would this have to be to be the smallest number that still rounds up? Well, we only round up if it's 5 or more. So 89.5 is the bare minimum that will round up to 90. So as you can see, the difference between these numbers is 0 0.5, right? I'll just take away 0 0.5. So to find the upper limit, all I do is I take the number and add 0 0.5. So now it's 90.5 metres, okay? For number 16, we have to solve these simultaneous equations. So how do we solve simultaneous equations? Well, all you need to do is make the number in front of one of the letters the same in both equations, okay? So first of all, I look. Are the numbers in front of x the same? No. Numbers in front of y? No. So that means I'm going to have to do some manipulation. And the way we manipulate is by timesing one or both equations by a number to make x or y the same. So looking at this, I can quite easily change the number in front of y here to make it into the number in front of y here. All I'd have to do is times it by 2, right? Because 2 times 2 would give me 4y. <clears throat> so, if I times the top equation by 2, that should give me a similar equation, where I have 4y and 4y. But remember, you do have to times the entire thing by 2. Now, I'm going to write this equation underneath here, and then I'm going to rewrite this second equation just to make it nice and clear. So that would be 10x, 5x times 2, plus 4y equals 27 times 2 is 54. Again, it is a calculator paper, so I don't need to be doing this in my head, but, you know, here we are. I'm going to write the exact same equation underneath, just to keep it nice and kind of simple. So, that's the first step. The first step is to make either the number in front of x or the number in front of y the same in both equations. Okay. After that, once you've done that, you have to decide if you're going to add or subtract the equations. Here's how you remember. If the sign in front of the letters is different, so different signs, you add, always. So a minus and a plus, or a plus and a minus, add. The same sign, the same sign, is always subtract. SSS, same sign, subtract, okay? So in this case, if I look at the number that's the same, we have 4y and 4y, do they have the same sign or different sign? 
Well, they have the same sign, they're both positive. So I'm going to subtract the two equations. Now again, you need to remember to subtract everything. You're doing 10x minus 6x, which is why I've written it in nice, like they're underneath each other, right? It's very clear to see. So 10x minus 6x is 4x. 4y minus 4y is zero, so I'm not even gonna bother writing it. And then we have 54 minus 28. Again, you can use a calculator if you want, but it's just 26. And then my last step is to divide both sides by four. And if you do that, you should get an answer of 6.5. Again, just as a bit of proof, 26 divided by four, 6.5. Okay, good. This gives you the majority of the marks. This gives you two marks. To get the last mark, you need to substitute this value of x into either one of the equations to work out y. So I'm going to put it back into the very original equation. That gives me 5 times 6.5 plus 2y equals 27. Expand the brackets. So I'm going to do 5 times 6.5 gives me 32.5. Perfect. I'm going to subtract 32.5 from both sides. So it gives me 2y is equal to 27 minus 32.5. And that gives me minus 5.5. And then lastly, once again, divide by 2 to get y is equal to minus 5.5 divided by 2, which is minus 2.75. Okay, so if you want to write the answer on the answer line, 6.5 and minus 2.75 for that question. For this question, we have some, a table showing information about the heights of 80 teenagers, and we need to work out an estimate for the mean. Now, normally when you work out the mean, you take the number, times it by the frequency, and add that up for all of these. So you do this number times eight, this number times 14, etc., etc. add them all up, then divide them by the 80 teenagers that we have. But there's a problem. What do I times eight by, 150 or 160? So, if you have ever have grouped data like this, you find the midpoint of each of these values. So I'm going to write midpoint as a new column in our table, okay? So, what's the midpoint of 150 and 160? Well, we can probably see it's 155. However, I'm going to show you a bit of a trick. Sometimes the numbers they give you are a bit difficult. So I'm going to show you how you can work out the midpoint of any number. You add the two numbers together, 150 plus 160, and then you divide them by two, and you'll always get the middle of two numbers. So they might give you something like 57.5, and the upper limit is 50, uh, 75 or something. Find the middle. And you need to find the midpoint. Bit tricky to do, right? But these numbers are actually relatively easy. We can just do this. Not too bad, not too bad, not too bad. Whoops and 195 like so now what you do is you just times those two columns together okay so let's work it out 155 times 8 gives me 1240 165 times 14 for those of you wondering if there's a faster way, there technically is. You could do all of this on the calculator in one step. And I'll show you that <clears throat> at the end, just, just in case you're interested. But for those of you that aren't sure, this is the best way to do it, to make sure everything's nice and neat. You get the maximum amount of method marks. And you also keep track of everything in your brain. It's nice. 30 times 185. Also, I will say that if you have a calculator in your hand, you can do this a lot faster than what I'm doing. Because I have to like use the mouse to do both the writing and the calculating. <clears throat> and 780. And once you're done, what you're going to do is you're going to add up all of these numbers. Okay? So, let's do that. 780 plus 550 plus 4200 plus 2310 plus 1240. That gives you 14,080. So the mean is that number that we just worked out, 14,080, divided by the number of teenagers we have. 
if they don't give you the number of whatever you have, teenagers, plants, whatever, all they've done is they've added up the frequencies for you. So 8 plus 14 plus 24 plus 30 plus 4. Right? So it's the same thing. Just in case they don't give it to you. And let's see what we get. So 1480, 1480, 80 is 176 centimeters. Sounds about right for average height. So to do this all in one kind of step in your head, what you can do is you get a fraction. On the bottom, you're going to put 80, the number that we have. And then here, we're literally going to do times 12, 40, and then add. And we're going to just do all of the midpoints times the frequencies. Whoops, sorry, not 12, 40, times 8. Okay. And then all you do is you do the exact same thing. Times, I won't do all of them, but then you do that for every single one of these. And you can basically do it on one step in your calculator. But, you know, it takes a bit of getting used to and it's a bit of a pain to put on the calculator as well. Okay, this is everyone's favourite startup question, right? Planting grass seed. Everyone cares about this. The diagram shows a plan of Jason's garden, so this weird looking shape. And it tells us the shape. So these are both rectangles. CDO is a right angle triangle, cool. And this thing here is a sector with angle 90 degrees. Now, the interesting thing here is that it says it's a sector with angle 90 degrees. So all that is, is a quarter of a circle which might make our life slightly easier a bit later on. Then it tells us he wants to cover his garden with grass seed. Each bag of grass seed covers 14 square meters and each bag of grass seed costs £10.95. How much will it cost? So they like to overload you with information, okay? But let's think about this logically, right? All we really need to focus on is those two bits of information. All of this is its extra noise that's going to disrupt your brain, okay? Think about it. If we want to work out how much money he spends on the grass seed, we need to know how many bags of grass seed he's going to need, right? Like if I asked you, how much are we going to spend on whatever, clothing or something, you need to know how many clothes you're going to buy, right? So we, all we need to do first is work out how many bags of grass seed he needs. And how do we determine that? Well, each bag covers 14 square meters. That's an area. So what we need to do is work out the area of this weird looking shape, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to label them one, two, three, and four, because they're four completely different shapes. So we're gonna have to work them out separately, add them all up, but I promise you it's not that bad. So if I look at shape number one, what shape is that? Well, it's a rectangle, right? And how do I work out the area of a rectangle? You do the width, times the length or however which way you want to do it. Basically we're doing seven times nine or nine times seven as I'm writing it for some reason. <laughs> but either way, that's just going to be 63 square meters. Okay. Shape number two. This is where things get interesting. It's a quarter of a circle. How do you work out the area of a circle? Well, it's pi times radius squared, right? So the area of a circle is pi r squared. So a quarter of a circle would be a quarter pi r squared. So we're going to do a quarter pi, then all we need to do is decide what the radius is. Well, the radius is going to be from the center O all the way to either F or A. And if I have a look, I don't have those numbers, but, right, this OF here is one of the sides of this rectangle, and opposite sides of the rectangle are the same length. So the radius is also 7 meters, okay? Those are the same. So we're going to do 7 squared. Now, this I'm going to need a calculator for because I can't do pi in my head. So we're going to do 1 oh, oh god. That was going to be a really weird looking formula. 1 quarter pi radius squared is 7 squared. That gives me... We could leave it in terms of pi if we want to be really precise. But let's do it as 38.49. How about that? It doesn't matter anyway because we're covering 14 square meters. So, but either way, 38.49. three by the way just so you're aware you only get which is, i don't like but you only get one mark for working out all four areas i know it's very harsh but you only get one mark this is a five mark question though so i'll show you where you get the rest of the marks but you only get one mark for working out all four of these areas anyways next shape is also a rectangle 11 times 7 which is 
77 meters squared. For what shape is that? It's a right angled triangle. So you're going to do, how do you work out the area of a triangle? You do half base times height. So we're going to do a half. The base is 11 and the height is 9. So it's a half of 99. So half of 99, 49.5. Okay, there you go. We have gotten our first mark. Now the second mark, you're gonna be quite pleased because all you need to do is add all those numbers up. And if you've worked out the numbers, I'm hoping adding them up isn't going to prove too tricky. So 38.49 plus 77 plus 49.5. That gives us our second mark, 227.99. And this is where the marks start coming in very, very quickly, okay? Because again, let's go back to our method, right? We want to work out how much money he spends on grass seed. To do that, we need to work out how many bags of grass seed he needs. To do that, we need to work out the area of his garden. So we've done that part. So now we can work out the number of bags he needs. And how do you work out the number of bags? Well, each bag covers 14 square meters. So what we could do is keep adding 14 until we get to 227. So for example, the first bag will cover 14, then 28, dot, dot, dot. And then we just count how many times you've added 14. But there's a more efficient way of doing it. Instead, all we actually need to do is take the number, the total, so 227.99, and divide it by the number or the amount of area that each bag covers. So we've got our total area. Each bag covers this area. So I divide it. I say, how many times does 14 fit into that area? And we're going to get a decimal, but this is good because then we get to use our brains. Okay. And this gives us, by the way, this actually gives us the next mark. Three marks. Quick, snappy, right? So 227.99 divided by 14. We definitely get a decimal 16.285, right? Now, I want you guys right now to have a think. Put your... You know, put yourself in Jason's shoes. 16 bags is not enough to cover his whole garden. And if you go to like home base and ask for 0.285 of a bag of grass seed, they'll look at you very confused. So his only option is to buy 17 bags, right? You can't order or ask for 0.285 of a bag. Okay, they'll look at you very weird. So he needs to buy an extra bag, okay? Boom, three marks so far. The next two marks are so nice. If you get up to this stage, if you get three marks, you're going to get five. Because guess what you do? Well, we want to work out how much money it costs, right? Well, he needs to buy 17 bags. Each bag is £10.95. So 17 times £10.95. That's the fourth mark. And just putting this on your calculator is the fifth mark. Hundred eighty six point one five. There you go. Fifth mark. So if you look, did all this work for two marks and then we get three marks very, very quickly. So just getting to this stage, if you get up to here, you're laughing. Easy peasy. OK, but this is a very it's a long winded question. I'll put it that way. It's not necessarily difficult. I'm sure all of us know how to calculate areas. Right. You may have forgotten a bit but you've, you're familiar with the concept. It's not conceptually challenging. It's just difficult to remember the formulas. But in terms of uh, actually doing it, it's actually not that bad. For question 19, it just says find the reciprocal of 0 0.8. So what they're trying to test here is that you know what a reciprocal is. Reciprocal is when you do one over. Okay. You can do this without a calculator, but we aren't nerds, so let's just use a calculator and use 0 0.8. And we get 5 over 4, so 1.25. That's it. One mark. It's basically an English test at that point. You're just testing your vocabulary. Now, here's where things get a bit more interesting. The error interval. So we have x is 4,700 to 2 sig fig. So it's been rounded to 2 sig fig. That's what they're trying to tell me. Complete the error interval. Well, it's rounded to two significant figures. So that's this figure here. So the smallest number will start with 4, 6, right? 
And actually, let me write over here. Now, what would the next number have to be? What's the smallest it could be to round up to seven? Well, if you remember, anything that's five or more, we round up. So the smallest it could be is five. And then for the last digit, the smallest it could be is, is zero, right? Because we don't actually care what the last digit is, but it should be zero for it to be the smallest. Cool. So now all I ask myself is, how do I get from 4,700 to 4,650? Well, I subtracted 50. So the other side of this is I add 50 to the original. 4,750. Okay? So you're just thinking about comparing what you did to get to the lower one, and you do it the same thing but in the opposite direction to get to the higher one. Okay? That's probably the one, of, I don't know, it's one way that I thought of uh, kind of doing it that might help. Question 20, we have some transformations. So S, now, and this, by the way, please, for the love of God, read the question. To be fair, I made this mistake until I read the question, but I assumed it was T onto S. Now, I know you're probably thinking, wouldn't it be alphabetical order, you idiot? You're right, but it's just because normally, I don't know, for me, it's like I read it left to right, but it says S onto T, so we're going this way, okay? Just as a reminder, I almost made that mistake but you know, I'm only human. It says, describe fully the single transformation. So transformations are, you have translation, you have enlargement, you have reflection, and you have rotation. Those are your, your main ones, okay? So all I do is I think about, okay, which one could it be? Well, first of all, has it changed size? Has it got bigger or smaller? No? Then it's not enlargement, okay? So let's, let's actually write these out, right? You have translation, rotation, reflection and enlargement. Since it hasn't changed physical size, I can cross that one out. Now what about these two? Well, the cool thing, well, okay, I keep saying cool, I'm sorry, I know it's not cool, but the interesting, it's not interesting either, the thing about rotation and reflection is it changes the orientation of the shape. So what I mean by that is, if I were to reflect shape T over here, I would have a backward shape, right? It wouldn't be facing the same direction. And if I rotated it, well, then it could be something like, it could be upside down, right? It could be something like, like this. Okay, I kind of joined it into one shape there, that was my bad. But it could be something like this, right? The point is, is this shape and this shape are in the same orientation. It's as if someone's picked it up and slid it across the graph, right? They haven't turned it, and they haven't enlarged it, and they haven't reflected and flipped it over. So it can't be rotation or reflection. And that's the thought process going through my brain. Okay, so if you're ever stuck, write them down and just think, okay, let's use our logic. Enlargement, or well, the size is the same, so it's not that. Has it orientated itself differently? Orientation just means if it's been flipped upside down or spun around or anything like that. If not, then it has to be translation. So just saying translation, will give you one of the two marks. So if in doubt, guess one of the four transformations, you'll get one mark, okay? One out of three or one out of two, it's better than none out of two, right? Or three. So how, well, how do you get the second mark? Well, you have to say how it's translated, right? You have to say by vector. Now with vectors, if you guys are a bit unsure, I do have a video on vectors. It goes all up to grade nine, but I actually separate it. I start from the bare minimum, the grade five stuff. Okay, and it'll go through these kinds of vectors. So I'd recommend that you watch that. You only have to watch like the first three minutes of it <laughs> because that's all that is for um, foundation. But here's how I do it. I take one point on here and the same corresponding point. Can we see those two are the same point, right? And all I say is, okay, how many to the left do I go to get here? I go one, two, three, four, five. Oops, don't know why I went that many times. I'll go five times to the left. So the top number of your vector tells you left and right. If you're going left, you make it negative. If you're going right, you keep it positive, okay? Then I ask myself, how many up or down do I go? Well, I go one, two, three, four, five, six. The bottom number tells me how far up and down I'm going. Negative is down, positive is up. I'm going up, so I'm going to leave it positive. That's how you get your second mark for that question, okay? Hopefully that makes a bit more sense. 
Here we have a right angle triangle and it just says calculate the value of x, so don't really say anything else. So right angle triangle, I'm immediately thinking Pythagoras and trigonometry. So how do I know which one to use, which is a common question I get. If you have an angle or you want an angle, always use trigonometry. In this case, I have an angle, so I'm going to be using good old fashioned trig. Okay, how do I use trig? Well, the first thing you do is you label up your sides. The side opposite the angle that you're given, or the one you want to work out, is called the opposite, shockingly. Opposite the right angle is called the hypotenuse, and the leftover side is the adjacent. Next thing you do is you write out the very awesome acronym. Actually, I think it's a... anyways. So Katoa. And what I do is I look at the sides I care about. I don't care about... Oh, I don't care. I don't have it and I don't want it, so I don't care. That leaves me with A and H. Well, which one of these three sets have A and H in it? The middle one. So this is the one I'm going to be using. And I can give you a formula triangle because I know formula triangles are quite nice. It's just cos of your angle, so we can call it whatever. Adjacent up the top, hypotenuse down here. So that is your formula triangle. For sine and cos, you can do the same thing for formula triangles, okay? Now, I want to work out the adjacent, so I'm going to cover up the adjacent. That gives me cos of my angle times h, so I'm going to do exactly that. Cos of 53 times 14.5, and that's your answer, okay? Well, I mean, it's not. We have to actually put it in the calculator first. But, now here's the thing that always, always trips people up. It opens a bracket for you because you need to tell the calculator what number's actually in the cosine. If I do this, make a mental note of that number, just like 0 0.66. Now here's what I actually want to do. See the difference? You have to close the bracket around the angle. Please, for the love of God, do it. It won't give you an error. It will just give you the wrong answer, okay? You've seen it firsthand, it will always give you the wrong answer. So it says to three sig fig, 8.73 to three sig fig. But yes, please, for the love of God, don't, <laughs> don't not close the bracket on your cos, sine, or tan, okay? Otherwise, I'll feel a physical pain in my head and I'll have to hunt you down, okay? Here we have the front elevation and the plan of a solid, which is shown on the grid. On the grid, draw the side elevation for the solid from the direction of the arrow. So I'm going to just quickly tell you or remind you what these words mean. A plan is a top-down view of an object. So imagine you're standing right over it, looking down at it. What kind of shape would you see? A, so a front elevation is what you see from the front, right? So from the front, when we look at this shape, it has this weird kind of diagonal, it's like a, almost like a staircase, but a really weird one. Um, it almost looks like someone wearing like shoes. Anyways, and we want to draw the side from the side that the arrow is pointing at. So if you imagine this object, look at it from the side, what would you see? Well, you can see it has two separate levels. And from here you can see it has two separate levels. So all you're going to do is draw those separate levels. So you're going to draw a little rectangle. And don't forget, it does have to be accurate. So if you look at the side, how many boxes wide is it? It's three boxes. So it should be three boxes wide on yours. In terms of the length, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we should draw one that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Dang it, okay, fine, can I? And then let's complete the rectangle. Because again, if you're looking at it from the side, you're going to see like its face, so to speak, right? So, actually, one thing that I want to change with this. The width is is three, but we're actually looking at the height, not the width, right? Because you're looking at it from the side, you'd see the height, which is one, two, three, four, five. I actually drew it right the first time. One, two, three, four, five. Complete the rectangle. And now what we're going to do is we're going to draw two lines that represent the actual change, well actually one line, that represents the change in the height. So if you notice, when we go, if we look here, 
one up, that's when it starts changing the elevation. So one up, we're going to start changing the elevation. Then it changes again after another one, two. So one, two. Draw a line there. Okay. Then it drops. But if you note, like think about it. If I look from the side, am I going to see the drop? No. So again, just, to, just so you're aware, we see this front bit. Then we know that the elevation changes. So you'd see a difference in that, right? You can see a slanted edge. So that's why you'd put that line. So it's the beginning of that slanted edge, then the end of it as it goes back up again. Okay. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. But again, it just requires a bit of imagination, which I always sucked at. So I completely understand if you do as well. For this question, it says the population of a town increased by 9% between 2018 and 2019. The population in 2019 was 165,680. So we need to calculate population in 2018. This is reverse percentages. So basically they've increased it by an amount, we need to decrease it by an amount. But you don't just take 9% of this and subtract it. Because this thing here is actually at 109% of the original value. 100% being the original value and adding on the 9%. And that equals 165,680. There are a few different ways to do this. Um, but one of my kind of favorite ways is just working your way down to get back to 100%. So what I do is I go down to 1%. If it's a calculator exam, by the way, that's what I do. So I divide both sides by 109. Again, only if it's a calculator exam. If it's not, then um, I do a slightly different method. But since there isn't a calculator exam anymore, don't got to worry about it, do we? Uh, divided by 109 gives me 1520. Then all we need to do to go to 100% is times by 100. Which we don't even need a calculator to do. It's just going to be 2, 0, and then add on two zeros. So in other words, 152,000. That's it. So again, that's my method for doing it. I think it's very simple, very basic, and you can kind of follow the steps quite easily. If you're unsure about it, I'd recommend going onto Maths Genie, doing some of the reverse percentages questions using this method. I personally think it's really easy to see. It's easy to see if you've made a mistake. But again, if you have your own method, that is obviously totally fine as well. And for the very last question, it's a coordinate geometry question, and it's pretty damn tricky, to be honest. This is actually in the higher paper as well. So give yourself a pat on the back if you manage to get this one right. Points L, M, and N are such that the L, M, that L, M, and N are on a straight line. Gives you the coordinates, gives you a ratio, find the coordinates of N. Here's what I would do. I would personally draw out a diagram. Right, and our axes are somewhere over here. Oh God, sorry for the horrifying display. Right. These are connected by some straight line. Yeah, it's a perfectly straight line, isn't it? L is minus three comma one. N are four comma nine. And N are don't know and don't know. We need, but we need to find the coordinates. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. It says, given that L to M, I forgot to write M, okay, is two, and this is three, what they've done is they've basically broken up this entire line into five parts, right? Two plus three is five. Now, we are going to first work out X, and then work out Y completely separately. So for a second, I want you guys to forget about the Y coordinates, okay? Pretend they don't even exist. We don't care about them. They can't hurt us, okay? Just for a second. Well, what is the difference between minus three and four? The way you can work this out is by doing 4 minus minus 3, right? But it gives you 7. Now, these two parts, that 7 is represented, represented by two parts, right? Which means that one part is going to equal 3.5. Now, how many parts are between and n. There's three parts. So three parts 
equals 10.5. So again, the reason why we're doing this is this whole line is broken up into five pieces. Between L and M there's two pieces, and we know that those two pieces are worth seven, because the difference in the x coordinate it goes from minus three to four, that's seven points, right? There are three pieces between M and N. So all I've done is I've worked out what the difference between their x coordinates are. It's plus 10.5. 4 plus 10.5 is 14.5. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track down here of the, actually does it give me a, yeah, it gives me a little answer slot right here. So that is 14.5. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Take a photo of it in your head. We're going to do the same process, but just for the y coordinates. So I'm going to get rid of the x coordinates just to make our life slightly easier. Okay. Now we're going to include the y coordinates. That's y, what, 1 even, I can read, and 9. Well, again, the difference between 1 and 9 is 8. And that's two parts. So one part equals four. Therefore, three parts equals 12. I've done the exact same thing. Look, both sides, the exact same thing. So to go from here to here, I've added eight. So to go from here to here, I need to add 12. Nine plus 12 is equal to 21. And that is the final answer for the question okay i personally think the mark scheme answer uh, method is kind of i don't know it doesn't make 100 percent sense but i'm hoping that makes a bit of sense okay if it doesn't again leave a comment and let me know so that is it for paper two in terms of aiming for grade five i do have again some predictive papers we can go through and things like that and practice papers but again uh, that I'll, I'll do that you know assuming you guys actually want it so do let me know in the comments if you'd like that. But other than that, I hope your exams are going very, very well. Hope your revision's going well. And, you know, we're almost halfway there before we're finished for good in terms of GCSEs.